Welcome to the WTFFF 3D Printing Podcast, all about the what of fused filament fabrication. Today, designers and hosts Tom and Tracy Hazard are live from South by Southwest with digital disruption expert Jay Salmon. I am so thrilled to be invited by TuneIn, so we want to thank them and South by Southwest because this is going to be a lot of fun for us to do this live and really talk about some advanced things in 3D printing. And as you heard in the intro, uh, we have Jay Samet with us today, and he's the author of a book called Disrupt You, and uh, we had him on the show, um, you know, once before last year, and we wanted to have him back for a deeper dive. He's the independent vice chairman of Deloitte Digital, and he's also speaking a couple times here at South by Southwest himself, so you're going to want to check that out. Uh, but anyway, we, you know, we usually, Tracy and I usually do an intro alone, and uh, now, it, before we even interview the guest, and so it's a little different, but... It's a little uh, different to do fun, live. <laughs> fun to have you here on the stage with us from the beginning, and thank you for joining us, Jay. Fun to be here. Well, you know, I'm, I really thought that we have a lot of people here who don't maybe listen to the WTFFF 3D printing podcast. And for those out there, it is not a swear. WTFFF stands for what? The fused filament fabrication. And fused filament fabrication is that geeky term for 3D printing. And we talk a lot more than about fused filament, which is really sort of the desktop version of 3D printing. We talk a lot more about all different kinds of disruptive technology, but mostly everything related to the 3D design of those things, including AR and VR, and just all types of applications for 3D design. So that's really what our podcast is focused on. We've done over 520 episodes over the past three years. So it's been well received, and we uh, we have about 100,000 listeners a month, something like that. And uh, I'm checking because it's, the stats change all the time. Um, but we really wanted to bring this here to you today and, and really talk about sort of disruptive innovation and the path of that, um, because we've got Jay here. Yeah, and actually, uh, for those of you listening... If you want to go and hear the first episode we did with Jay last year, that's episode 504 of WTFFF. And the title is called Forget Disruptive Technology, Disrupt You Instead with Jay Samet. And, you know, uh, another thing I want to mention today, we're, uh, Jay has signed uh, one of his books for us, and we're going to give away one to one of the audience members here watching live today. So you want to stick around to the end so that you might be that lucky person. And then we're going to give one away for the live Facebook feed, which will be later in the week and the podcast when the podcast actually airs. Yeah, and actually, um, those of you who are watching this um, recorded or on Facebook, if you go and uh, like our 3D Start Point Facebook page, which is the home for the WTFFF podcast, then we're also going to pick a lucky person who comments on the Facebook feed when this airs live, and you would also be sent another book, uh, one of Jay's books signed by him. So... Definitely uh, make sure you go and, and like 3D Starpoint and comment when we air. And, and this will take a week, so next Friday. I don't know the date, do you? But anyway, next Friday, uh, we're going to give that away. The 16th, I think. March okay. 16th. All right. So onward. So now let's dive into deep into disruption with Jay Samet. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about Jay, which, I mean... There's so much to talk about. I, I don't even... He's independent vice chairman for Deloitte Digital, which has to be, I think, the coolest job, as it's been termed by Wire magazine. Um, he focuses on providing virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality solutions for corporate and public sector clients, and he has more than 30 years' experience in digital transformation. <laughs> Not that old. <laughs> and uh, he helps grow pre-IPO companies and big brands like EMI, Sony, and doing things like cool things like mobile video, internet advertising, e-commerce, social networks. I don't think there's a part e-books. I don't think there's a part you didn't touch. Yeah, we can skip the intro. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but billions of us use products and services and digital goods that Jay's been responsible for. It's fun. So why we're here and why this all ties in is we're living in this era of endless innovation. We're living in a time where 100-year-old companies disappear, and every 48 hours, there's a new billionaire created. They didn't go to the right schools. hours. They didn't come from money. Something has changed. And the main thing is, you're holding something in your pocket, or staring at it right now and typing on why I'm talking, um, <laughs> that connects you to 7 billion people. So you only have to be right for a nanosecond to become rich or change the world or whatever you want to accomplish. 
So you write a col- you write a column or articles on yeah entre- write, a, write a column for uh, Fortune magazine for Fortune magazine and it, you're obsessed with AR. In yeah, it. So There's a lot of AR content there. <laughs> so for people to think things have been overhyped, uh, everything that you do in work, play, shopping will completely change over the next five years. If you thought getting a PC changed the world, and it did, and then the web changed the world, second transformation, and then taking all that to mobile and connecting us all to each other was a huge transformation. The biggest transformation is about to happen, which is all of mankind's knowledge colluding to bring information to you. So the air of you searching for answers goes away when everything just appears before you. And we're talking about the launch of a trillion dollar industry. Pretty cool. Well, you've been obsessed with all these things digital for quite some time. How did that sort of obsession start for you, young? Um, I didn't set out to be an entrepreneur. I didn't set out to start companies like you know what I did with eBay and LinkedIn and everything. Uh, I got out of college, bought into society's rules of get good grades and get a job and live happily after, and there was a recession, there were no jobs. Uh, If you're sitting in the live audience, look at the person next to you, over the next decade, half of all jobs in the US disappear, so one of you's out. Um, So what I realized real early was you could go and try to compete for a job against somebody that has a ton of experience, or you could go do something that no one's done yet. And you're either the best at what you do in the world or the only one doing it, and if you're the only one doing it, by definition, you're the best. So I always jumped on the next thing. And so the PC was very good to me, and the web was very good to me, and mobile was very good to me. And AR is just unbelievable. Hmm. Well, Jay, I think for a lot of people, the idea of being disruptive and on the edge again and again is inherently risky. As opposed to the job that pays oh, you. So, so the, the old adage, you know, you know, you could get a job at that company, well, we're at the 60th anniversary of the Fortune 500, and less than 57 of the original on the list are still around. So it isn't that security robs ambition, it's the illusion of security that robs ambition. Mm. And as you watch these larger companies go, the more time you're spending at a large company, the more myopic your view becomes until you become the foremost expert at that department. And I was running one of the world's largest music company when the industry went from 40 billion to 20 billion in one year. So you, you knew how to break a song. You know how to get it on radio. You know how to work with a physical retailer of the Midwest. Great skills. <laughs> Until it all changes. Right. And what, I guess, Napster and MP3s brought all that crashing down, right? So if you start looking at yourself differently and you see how malleable you are, then you can see how, how easy it is to change the world. Wow, and, and for th- those out there looking at 3D printing, because that's you know, obviously what our focus is here, that's 320 million jobs estimated as being lost around the world in manufacturing. I mean, that's significant, and a, I, think the, I think the number's a little low, but it said 15% of retail would disappear as well. I think it's gotta be higher than that. I, 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 I um, just had dinner with somebody who is a manufacturer in Asia, who's well known, that has one million employees in their factories. And he was telling me that they now have five factories that they call lights out. And I'm like, ooh, they work in the dark. It sounds so cool. No, lights out means there's not a single human in the factory. And they're... So it doesn't need light. <laughs> right. And so they're looking to, you know, expand that number rapidly. And they're the largest manufacturer in the world. So it's coming. But the flip side is there's huge opportunity. So my talk tomorrow is, you know, augmented reality, you know, uh, job killer or economic savior. And so disruption, for anybody to get one thing out of this talk or one thing out of Disrupt You, the book, disruption isn't about what happens to you. It's about how you respond to what happens to you. You always have a choice. And so you can make those choices. So in 3D printing, we now get to a customized world, a bespoke world. And anybody that isn't setting up their supply chain to be digital, to respond to those demands, to allow people to have input into the products they want, will be cannon fodder. Yeah, you know, it's been a lot slower. This is when we started the podcast three years ago. This was kind of our focus. We were wondering whether or not there was a market for those products because that's what we do. Tom and I are product designers. We've designed products for mass market retail for 20, 25 years. Oh, God. I Too just many. I don't like to think about it. How old I am? 25 uh-huh. years. And so we've done things that you buy every day at Costco and Walmart and Target. And, and we look at that and we want to be on the edge. So we, we got in very early on 3D printing to sort of explore that. But what we found out really quickly was that there wasn't a market for our skills yet and there wasn't a market for our products yet because 
it was, uh, you know, lots of resistance and friction along the way, which I'm sure you're aware, looking at what happened with Sony. There's a lot of resistance in that retail market in because they're all invested in inventory and warehousing and their trucking or whatever their specialty is, supply chain, all of those things. There's a lot of uh, investment in there. So the resistance to change. So when there isn't an investment in the digital good side of things, the design of those digital products don't exist today. They exist in some formats, but not in all products. And when they don't exist, it's hard to imagine a world at which you can provide them. So there's been this slowdown of, of adoption into what we would call retail reality. There used to be a strategic advantage of having the, owning the means of production. So if you had the biggest factory you could make, and I, I talk about the example of, of motor oil. Um, anybody old enough to remember motor oil coming in round cardboard tubes mm. that you stab with the knife and, and when you open the second we're, can we're it's slippery enough. and you stab yourself. <laughs> we're old enough obviously we're like nodding over here. <laughs> um, the dumbest product in the world but Quaker State had the biggest factory could, could make up more cans than anybody else nobody could touch them in price. They weren't going to build a new factory they put all their money into their factory and then Pennzoil made a little plastic bottle and then because they could make plastic any shape they made it in a shape that they could get two bottles in the space that it took on the shelf to put one of those round things. Suddenly, sales took off, and they ended up buying their competitor. So the, the lesson there today is the advantage isn't the means of production. The only advantage any company has today is the speed at which they can react to their consumer data. Insights are the difference in the advantage that you have. And if you're not doing it, uh, Zara, one of the biggest uh, retailers out there, changes virtually all their inventory every 10 days. Many of their competitors are set up with the, here's our season, here's what we're doing for this line for the fall or the spring or next year or two years from now. That doesn't work anymore. So true. I think we have some disruptors out here. How many of you are working in an advanced technology or disruptive technology? Well, we've got some. So, you know, advice for some disruptors perhaps, Jay. So it depends where you are in the food chain. So if you're at the beginning of your career, congratulations. You are now working at the craziest company you've ever seen or could imagine until you get your second job. And what you're frustrated is you know how it should change and your supervisor doesn't understand or doesn't see it or doesn't see the writing on the wall. Well, you have two choices. You can point it out to them or their boss or their boss's boss and one of two things will be happening. You'll get promoted and get thanked or you'll be shown the door. Well, if you're shown the door, they're actually doing you a favor because any company that's not listening to their employees and listening to changes, they're going away. And we're watching it happen so fast and so often. Um, on the other hand, there's no longer any barriers to market. There's no gatekeepers stopping you from getting cash. So you have crowdfunding, you have VCs, you now have ICOs. You have people would literally write a business plan and raise 70 to $100 million in 48 hours. I mean, this was the year of the ICOs, in, initial coin offerings, uh, alternative currency. So, it's really about solving a problem. So if you have problems in your life, congratulations, you're halfway there, okay? Look at what new technologies can address those problems. You know, I, I give thousands of examples of people that became you know, billionaires with the simplest thing, but they, they, my go-to simple example is you're sitting in traffic and two, two kids were sitting in traffic in Tel Aviv, not as bad as it was this morning getting into Austin, and it dawned on them, the phone company knows where their phone is. It knows where the other guy's phone and the other car is. If they tell him to go left and me to go right, there's no traffic. They name their company Waze, and without a dollar in revenue, they became billionaires in less than a year. It is that easy. So there's only two things you need to succeed, insight and perseverance. You can't be taught perseverance, but insight can be taught, and that's what I focused on to disrupt you. And if I could just go on something new that I haven't announced. That Please. I wanted, to, wanted to say for everybody here. I'm, I'm humbled that the book's in its third printing and in eight languages and it's coming out in uh, uh, Portuguese in, in June and, and Korean in July. Uh, but occasionally I get a letter from somebody that says, that's all great, all these people can do this thing, but not me, right? You say no to me, that's the greatest way to get me motivated in life, okay? <laughs> so what I took out of that was I'm now in the midway through doing my version of Pygmalion, okay? I found a couch surfing millennial, and I said, I'm going to, easy to find if you have a couch, 
Um, <laughs> he knew no one in, in, in Los Angeles where I live, and I said, I, I will mentor you for one year. I won't open up the Rolodex, I'm not cheating. And the most he, he's a high school uh, uh, dropout, didn't go to college, uh, you know, normal life. But he showed perseverance. And I'll mentor you for a year and take you from couch surfing to a self-made millionaire. And most he ever had earned was $35,000 a year. And I'm not selling get rich quick and I don't sell seminars. This isn't a pitch to, to you know, where I'm sitting on the Lamborghini. This is just, I wanted to show that it could be done, okay? And the first month, not to kill the whole book in advance, but it walks you through how to do it. First month, he did 70,000, and he, he could fly coast to coast without a plane. I mean, he was like, he didn't believe it was possible. Second month, 83, third month, he brought, broke the 100 grand, and he keeps on going. And it's a dialogue, because I'm now learning how today's world exactly is, so I can take the disrupt you method and really zero in on any opportunity. You know, isn't that exactly, I mean, I think why you've been in the position that you've been is that you've learned so much along the way, learned as much from the disruption that you cause <laughs> to be able to inform the next thing that you do? Yeah, well, it's, it's my way of paying it forward. I don't know how much time I have left. And yeah. I do believe that the only way you have a stable democracy is by having a strong middle class. And the middle class is being eviscerated. Well, the, especially if we lose all these jobs. Well, not just... That, but if you look at the history, and I've raised hundreds of millions of dollars from Silicon Valley, I love Silicon Valley, they've been great to me, but it's been a winner-take-all monopoly, right? We all know eBay, name the number two auction site, right? Name the number two of any of the categories that doesn't exist, so you have a consolidation. And if we do that globally, it's very destabilizing. On the other hand, everybody has the power to do this. As long as there's still problems to solve, there's still opportunity. Problems, just opportunity in disguise. But we don't teach it. We teach this agrarian, you know, you know, here's two ducks and two ducks equals four ducks, and that's wonderful. Um, we teach people to have enough knowledge to go on a battlefield or to go into a factory. Those days are gone. Hey, WTFF listeners. I've got something exciting to share with you today. I recently received some of the new PETG filaments that Keen Village Plastics has introduced into the 3D printing market. And I have to say that I love these new colors. They're quite different than the common colors that we're all used to seeing available in the market. And they're all available in both 1.75 and 2.88 millimeter. For a limited time, Keen Village Plastics would like to offer WTFFF listeners a free sample coil of one of their new sparkle materials in a unique color. Just go to 3dstarpoint.com forward slash village and fill out the form to get your free sample. You will also receive a special code for a discount on your first purchase of any of the vast assortment of more than 50 color combinations in a wide range of different plastics. I'm so excited about these new materials, and I know you will be too. So go to 3dstarpoint.com forward slash village, fill out the form, and request your free sample today. We were talking beforehand about the fact that it was International Women's Day last week, or I guess it's still technically this week. And, um, and that in your book, you cite, according to Nielsen Research, women are responsible for more than 83% of consumer purchases. I actually cite 86% at mass market retail. And they've generated virtually all the income growth experienced in the U.S. during the past 20 years. But we, what we were talking about is that there's not enough. And in fact, there was a talk here today, which Zach over there <laughs> attended with me, about designing with bias, that there's not enough women product designers. There's not enough, there's not enough diversity. It's, it's not, not just, just women. It's not just design, by the way. I speak on panels all over on all kinds of subjects. And I'm amazed at how many conference after conference, it's the old white guy conference. Um, and I'm glad I got included. But you know, <laughs> I'd like to hear some other viewpoints. But one of the stories that tell in there uh, that is exactly this point uh, in Disrupt You. There was a woman who got a sales job in Florida for a conservative company, and she was required to wear a pantyhose. Ladies, it's Florida, it's humid, she wants to wear sandals, this thing isn't working. So she tries cutting off the toes, she's tried different stuff, she finally comes up with a product idea. Turns out all the hoseries are made in the Carolinas, so she goes up there and goes to the factories, and to a person, every single person that she talks to at those factories are all men. And they all That's tell right. her, it's a stupid product, it's dumb. One ripped up her card right in front of her face and told her, you know, go. Uh, so she didn't have a dime to her name. She went to Barnes & Noble and bought, I can't make the story up, patents for dummies. She wrote did. her own patent. She didn't have a, d a dime to her name. 
and Sarah Blakely and Spanx. She's now a multi-billionaire. Guys, you don't know what it is, but women don't leave home without it. Uh, and she changed the world by coming up with a new category, okay? That's what happens when you have diversity. And diversity isn't just a buzzword. It's about having different points of view. If you have all your designers in the US designing cars from Morocco where the streets are four feet wide, for some reason the SUV doesn't sell. <laughs> and you know, when you have uh, Detroit name a car for Latin America, the Nova, which in Spanish means no go, it turns out nobody wanted to buy the Nova. Um, so those are silly examples, but they go on every day. And, and it's so easy to get other viewpoints. It is, it's so easy. Well, Jay, you know, one of the most important lessons I think was you share in your book is that it's incumbent upon us innovators to, you know, communicate the future in a way that people living in the past can really comprehend. Yeah. You know, you're talking about building a bridge. Can we discuss that a little bit? How yeah. do you talk to those people and get them to see the light? So when I was half my age and I knew everything, um, <laughs> I used to leave meetings so frustrated. Why don't they get it? I, I mean, I remember pitching one of the biggest corporations in the world of, of this great digital plan for them, and I'm going down to the CEO's office down the long hallway, and this is in this century, passing IBM Selectric after IBM Selectric. There wasn't a single PC on the C-suite floor, and I go, this is not going to go well. And then I'd leave all mad, why don't they get it? It's not their job to get it. If you're the innovator, if you're the disruptor, it's your job to communicate the future in a way that people stuck in the past can comprehend. Okay? If you can't communicate, if you can't comprehend, you can't make change. Okay? So that's where change begins. It's not you're wrong, I'm right, because then there has to be a winner and a loser, and they've already won. They're in the C-suite. The biggest challenge for a lot of companies is what got the people in that corner office won't get them to the promised land. The world has changed. And how to recognize that, how to communicate that, how to disrupt yourself, because you're going to be disrupted. I mean, the classic example, Kodak invented the digital camera. But it didn't have the same margin and competed with film. And they owned the film world. So whoever was put in charge of the digital camera, your career is pretty much over. But Kodak didn't realize innovation happened. So somebody else come out with it. And today, there's no more Kodak. And we all have digital cameras and several of them on us. You know, and life has changed. We now take more photos this year than the history of mankind up until this year combined. Yeah, you know, this is, this is classic. We hear this a lot of times when we get inventors who come and talk to us about their product ideas and that they, they want to be secretive about it or they, they're so afraid because of that Kodak world that someone's going to buy their patent or license it. Oh, no, what? Someone's going to steal it. Somebody's going to steal it, right? And they're going to, but they're going to do, they're going to sit on it. They're going to shelve it. Like, we hear this all the time. But you're a fan of zombie ideas, which I totally love. Yeah. And that's about being very public about what you're working on because... If you don't have a team that's diverse, that's the best way to get feedback. Yeah, so let's, let's bust some myths right here. No one's going to steal your stupid idea. Your, <laughs> I, your idea sucks. I guarantee it. I don't care what it is. And I, I'm your friend. I'm, I'm just telling you honestly. If you, if you go to every VC, every VC's first rule is they love you. They love your idea. They went back and talked to the partners. Eh, the partners didn't like it, but come back next time. Because they, they want to keep the door open. Your idea sucks. Why does it suck? Because Ideas don't come fully formed from God to you, okay? It's not the flux capacitor. You're not Doc Brown sitting on the toilet and boom, okay? What happens is you start off with a, a thread of an idea, something that seems to make sense, some empty piece of land, and if you go further into the dirt than anybody else did, that's where you discover it. This music conference has a tech conference because a failed music company with a few last dollars decided to play with some short messaging and a music company called Twitter changed what they were doing, they pivoted, okay? So what's going to happen is you're going to pivot. And you're going to want to tell everybody your idea for a simple reason. It is so hard to launch a business. It is so hard to get funding. It's so hard to become that billionaire that believe me, anybody you're telling is most likely too lazy to do it, okay? I have yet to have somebody come and say, here's proof that somebody went and took my idea. Um, now, when you start sharing that idea, Share it not with friends and well-wishers, okay? You want somebody to kill your idea. That's why I call it a zombie idea. Find people that can actually use it. We call it, we call it don't tell your idea to the yes men and yes women in your life, like the ones who goes, oh, you're so wonderful, of course it's great. You don't want those people. And then you don't want the moms and dads. I have 
my, it's usually my dad, who will say, oh, yeah, you shouldn't do that because they're so afraid for you. Pretend. So you have them on both sides, right? Go find, you know, 20 potential customers and ask them why they won't buy it. Not why do they like about it, what doesn't it do? And now you start taking that rough piece of marble that you started with as an idea and you're chipping away and chipping away and chipping away until nobody can find a fault with it. If nobody can kill it, then it's a zombie idea. Then it's this idea that will just go and just keep on coming and, and that's where you see the big successful because when you're doing those iterations, each version of your product is happening between your two ears. It's not, you're not burning through capital. If you go and raise a bunch of money on your idea and then start doing this, you're burning through all that capital and one of two things that will happen. One, you run out of money and buy buy, okay? Two is actually more painful. There's a lot of people that keep on funding you, so by the time your idea is a home run, you own 3% of your own company, okay? Um, I mean, I've started companies where, you know, we've sold them for 600 million and sold them for a billion. And you don't own all of it, you don't own enough of it. You know, it's very rare that you've done it the right way the first time. So that's why I'm trying to pay it forward so that you don't become a slave of your own idea. Oh, that's so true. Let's pivot a little bit and talk a little bit about skill gaps because we think we have one here in 3D printing and we may have one in AR and VR as well where we, we just don't have quite enough designers, we don't have quite enough uh, skills to be able to do the professional content required. So, you know, when you're talking about music and, and Apple goes to create iTunes, they already knew there was a lot of indie musicians, those that were eager to be published and distributed. And there was, of course, the labels. So there was already professional musicians. But in the 3D design world of design of products, as I mentioned earlier, we don't have like a library of designs that just aren't getting made right now or professional designs. We have lots of free libraries of amateur content, things that moms wouldn't buy. And if moms don't buy it, then it's not getting bought at retail. So, you know, how does that, how does that grow and where does the investment need to happen to really bring those skill set up so, the, so that it can grow faster, the industry can move faster? So in each new marketplace, you have to build a dual-sided marketplace. There has to be a reason why a consumer is going to come and there has to be a reason why a designer is going to put their designs there. If there were a million designs up there, everybody decorating their home would go there to look for lamps, okay? And if everybody was buying lamps there and you were creating a lamp, you'd put that up. So how do you get to that stock? So Reed Hoppen, who did the intro to, to, to disrupt you and is the smartest human being I've ever met, uh, when we were working on LinkedIn, they had the same dual-sided problem. Okay, why would anybody put up a resume if there's no jobs? And why would I look for job people if there's no resumes? How do you get that inflection point? And that's where marketing comes in. You really have to market and develop that community. And the, 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 the exact turning moment for LinkedIn was when a guy who was looking for a job in the White House named Obama and the world's richest man, Bill Gates, both signed up and put up their profiles on the same day on LinkedIn. What a coincidence. And wow. happened to tell the press. And then everybody goes and checks it out and there's enough activity. You know, it's very similar to when you went to the best party of your college years was in a small dorm room. If that same party had been in one of the ballrooms at this hotel, and 12 people show up in a room for 2,000, it doesn't look very good. So figure out a test market. Don't be all 3D things to all things. What is one specific item that there's so much need for customization that people will search for it? eBay took off because people would spend their weekends going to flea markets to find a motorcycle part from a 1929 Indian motorcycle, okay? So when all the young people were on the internet and nobody over 40 had discovered the internet, their average person was over 40 and spending 45 minutes per visit on the site. So solve a problem and then expand that market base. Zuckerberg didn't wake up one day and say, I'm making a social media for everybody on the planet. He did Harvard. That's right. He did Ivy Leagues. He did the US and so on and so on. And here's the great thing about living in this connected world. If you can prove that micro market, whatever it is, you can then get as much cash as you want and lose money for as long as you want, <laughs> okay? Because if you can prove that people prefer ride sharing or hailing to waiting in the rain for maybe a cab comes by, you can lose a billion dollars a quarter until you take over the world and there's no competition. So that's the model. Hmm. Why aren't you doing it? 
<laughs> Why aren't we doing it? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm dying to do it. But, but Jay, you know, we have so much experience in mass market retail of conventional products. We understand that industry very well. It is conventional retail as we know it in the U.S. today a dinosaur? Is it a dead man walking? Because you're going to talk retail in like half an hour, right? <laughs> what a great segue. Yeah. If anybody wants to go to me to Max's Dive, that's my next talk. And tomorrow, I'm speaking upstairs at 5 p.m. on augmented reality. So here's my opinion. The idea of going to a store to choose from a subset of the products available to you on the planet to buy something is over. None of you do it, okay? So don't look shocked. You all showroom? Do you know? Have you ever heard that term before? Yeah, you, you know what it is. Actually, here up in Domain, up, up in town, there's a store called Beta that isn't meant to sell anything. It's all the coolest electronics on the internet. What? So traditional retail is dead. Brick and mortar is not dead. What's the difference? Destination that is an experience. That's why you'll leave the home to experience something that you can't do in your living room, to share it in different ways. So uh, working with a, a, a European automaker, when you go in, in, in Europe into their showroom, they will not let you see the car. Let that sink in for a second. You schlepped your ass into the dealership and they're not gonna show you the car. They're gonna put you in a white room and they're going to let you design your own car. And then when you finish designing that car, they ask you to do like the mountains, the beach or whatever, and then you're going to see it in VR in this beautiful, exactly, I mean, it's like putting yourself into your own fantasy, okay? Then you see the car that they have. You know what? It doesn't look as good as the one you just designed. They're selling 30% more upsells of customized features. And when I just designed my first car, not as a designer, I'm not a designer, as pick this, pick this, pick this, because Tesla doesn't let you buy a car off the lot. Every car is bespoke to your choices. And if it's something that you've invested time into making, you're willing to wait. You know, my first job out of college was working for an um, automotive textile company in South Carolina. And I was shocked when I went in there and they said, oh, you need to design and figure out the color trends for the cars. And um, this is going to be a model 10 years from now. I looked at them and I was like, are you kidding me? How do I know today what's going to be sold in 10 years? Well... It's because automotive is 10 years behind, right? They're, uh, they're outdated. So I can see why 30% more upcharge because, hey, they, ha they didn't get it right, right? Because they had to make this, they had to test it, they had to tool for it. They didn't get it right from a feature and a colors perspective or a material perspective. It is tough to change an ongoing business. I mean, yeah. dinosaurs got really big. They ruled the earth and whatever, and they'd fight each other like in those King Kong movies. They didn't notice little mammals scurrying around, okay? So you're that little new annoying thing. The big company isn't going to try to stop you. Matter of fact, I've been a public CEO. Here's what's going to happen. If you're right, those big dinosaurs do have momentum, which means cash. They'll buy you out at a huge multiple. And don't get cocky. Say yes. And the reason is say yes. because you're only going to be right for that same nanosecond, okay? You're not always going to be right, always be ahead. And the very few people, you know, and I, 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 my son's the same age as Mark Zuckerberg. And when he turned $2 billion down, I'm like, if they had offered my son $2 billion, and he said no, I'd hit him over the head with a baseball bat, <laughs> forge his name. And when he comes out of the coma, he'd hate me, but he'd be rich. Um, you know, Zuckerberg was the exception. He was somebody that it's actually so had a vision and, and, and kept control of his company and kept control of the board and executed magnificently him and, and, and his team. But that's rare. And Very if you're rare. so good and so smart, and I sit on, on, I've sat on enough boards with, with the next generation, then do it again. Okay? So just to, for the, the USPTO statistics, the Patent and Trademark Office in the US, is less than 2%, less than 2% of patents. And remember, Apple filed I don't even know how many patents, thousands. Tens of thousands. Tens of thousands patents. So they're in the mix there. Less than 2% of patents make their inventors any money. I'll tell you one that Apple, and patents are public, so you can look. Apple is one that I've been waiting for for years. Apple patent tennis shoes, okay? <laughs> and the tennis shoes use kinetic energy to charge your battery. So every time you walk, it's capturing that energy. Sounds kind of awesome. So if your battery's running low, you can just run, Mama, hold on, hold on, hold on. Um, 
soon we got to have something kinetic that keeps us charged. I mean, that, that just seems like such an easy product to have. You know, I had the Fitbit for a lot of years, and I was super motivated to walk so many steps, but I'd be more motivated if the other choices I lose you know, access to the internet. Well, yeah, especially when your Fitbit says, oh, wow, you just walked for three hours around South by Southwest, and what, you burned all of 56 calories. Like, really not helpful, right? So, you know, but hey, my phone had a full charge. I would have walked everywhere to make that happen yesterday because oh, I was dying. But <laughs> the other category, and notice his handsome 3D printed tie, available in many metallic shades as well. <laughs> um, but wearables is going to be a huge area. So we're going to have a huge shortage of, of physicians. Okay, but the flip side is we can have the same diagnostics that doctors get nowadays available 24-7 feeding us. One of the things that I got from my, my, my uh, sports band that I was wearing for a number of years is, yeah, I wasn't killing it for my age when walking, okay, but I was in the number one percent of people not sleeping. Uh, and it was telling me that if you don't sleep, oh, you sorry, my mic was shaking, you know, you know, not sleeping for three days does cause psychosis, you know. 87% of people your age sleep, you know. Uh, it kept on, it was the world's largest sleep study, right? So wearables are doing lots and lots of things to make our lives better. So there are so many new opportunities to build a business around that. What's the wearable for a certain situation? What's the new eyewear? So, you know, I'll be showing, you know, augmented glasses that beam the object into the back of your eyeball. The back of your eyeball, we all see the same. So you don't need prescriptions, you don't need lenses, you don't need any of that. And it's opaque, so people can walk around it, it's there. And so many things at retail will be different. So now you can have virtual inventory in the store. So a small shop can have everything in every color. And that's where, you know, you'd want to talk about that sort of, as we were talking about that path to being able to explain it, or that bridge to being able to explain to the old white guys in the room, right? Supply chain and delivery and inventory, all of these, we call it carrying costs of products, is so high right now, it's waiting to be disrupted. It just needs proof that what you have, people will buy, and they will, they will shift out of that so fast because that cost factor in their business is gigantic. And remember, when you buy something and there's 12 shades, you're actually paying for the pink shade that you didn't buy because that excess inventory never sells. Um, so there's a huge opportunity that if you can go into retail, and the reason why it will be an experience that you can't have at home is the edge computing and, and the 5G and the streaming of all this magnificent 3D polygons. You won't have that in your house for a while. But you'll have this amazing experience when you go into the store and you can actually see all the sofas in scale, um, you know, and you can do simpler things at home. Uh, many people have gone through and suffered through in their relationship, doesn't matter which side of the relationship you're on, where you paint four different versions of the beige on the wall um, because somebody can't make up their mind. Um, but nowadays, you can just put on your AR glasses in the whole room. You can adjust to whatever color, and then instantly that color is mixed for you. Either comes the next day, or you can go pick it up. These aren't science fiction. These are things that my clients are, are doing right now. No, and the reality is that people at you know buying something at retail, especially housewares, I would say is is a huge category where you know your average set of dishes is white, and and it's white because they have to carry it in 3,000 stores, and they have to have all this inventory, and they're so afraid to make a mistake and buy a color that isn't going to sell. If you can get it exactly your color the way you want, delivered to you you know, a few days a week later, on demand, but how 3D cool printed. Would, we're, we're going to lose Toys R Us this week, yeah. okay? Yeah. Um, and I'm a big kid, if you haven't figured that out. How cool would it be to be able to go into a toy store and see the TIE fighters flying around, you know, the Death Star and everything, and have a whole battle scene? And maybe you'd buy one more Lego set because you want to have that to spark people's imagination, spark kids, to show how things can look. Um, most people don't have a design aesthetic. Um, there's a lot of studies of retail, whatever you put on the mannequin turns out to be your best seller. That's uh, right. That happens everywhere, it's especially in furniture. So if whatever the floor sample is, that's what's sold 80% of the time. So it's an 80-20 rule, if you're familiar with that term. So 80% of the volume comes from 20% of the SKUs, and typically that's what the display model is. And for is. those of you that are on the data side of this, and they're data scientists, and you're in massive demand, um, check your data at the door. Because you have to make sure that you're yes. putting good stuff in. Because what will happen is the red dress is on the second floor, the white dress is on the first floor. All their data shows 90% of people prefer the white dress, so they stop making the red dress. Whereas it was a where you put in the store issue, not a 
you know, or what was on the mannequin or whatever. So yeah, that's you know. so true. So we were there was some talk about bias in the in the data, and this happens all the time in data, and this is a concern about AI. I'm not concerned about designers being outdone by AI or engineers being done outdone by AI because I know that the data's bad. I know that the data doesn't have a lot of representation. You're laughing because it's true because if it doesn't if you haven't sold it at retail, you don't really know if it will sell, right? So if it never made it past the the gatekeepers, you don't know if it will work. So your data's already wrong because AI depends on failure, right? Learning what doesn't work, what does work, and then doing more of that. So when we don't have a lot of, of sense of what's going on there, we have a big power, uh, power time at which we need to build better data. Well, we could do a whole session on AI, but, right. but for, the, for the layman to understand, the big concern of AI isn't Skynet coming to kill you in your sleep. The big, that'll happen. Um, the big, <laughs> and I know where you live. Um, the, the big concern is we don't know in true AI how the decision was made. Okay, so a great example was they showed, I don't know, remember details, but 10,000 photos of wolves and 10,000 photos of huskies and mixed them up and, and the AI figured out better than any human which were wolves and which were huskies. But when they dug into the why of it, there was snow in the wolf pictures. The machine never looked at the dogs, okay? So it was solving a different problem but coming with the right result. So another example of that is there's an automaker that made two self-driving cars and they named one AJ and one Bobby. And they raced them around the car, around the track, no drivers, identical hardware, identical software, and AJ won. So they put the one on the, was on the left on the right and vice versa, they did them again, and AJ won, and AJ won again, and they tried every different way to do it. AJ learned something in that first race that Bobby will never know. <laughs> but the programmers don't know what it is that the car learned. They still don't know to they this know. day? Yeah. Wow. So. That's the thing. There can be gender bias in AI. There can be racial profiling in, in, in AI. So if you have bad data, you may get a functionally good answer for a reason that isn't valid. Wow. <laughs> it blows my mind. Go down that rabbit hole. But no, but it is so true. We do see this. And this is where, you know, we really look at, like, the visionaries in the world. And there has to be those. That's, I mean, there's a part of it as being a disruptor, finding that opportunity gap, as we've been talking about a lot here. But there's also about having that vision for where it's going to go and holding hard and fast to that. The best way to predict the future, and this is somebody who's been doing it accurately for 30 years, is to hang out with the people that are actually coding it, Okay. Because what's really interesting is most of the new products that are coming out, you can read about, you can know about, but the people who are building them have no idea why. Let that sink in. That's your opportunity. A scientist has, by definition, no freaking idea what they're doing. That doesn't mean they're stupid. Their job is to discover something that they didn't know. Their job wasn't to make a better razor blade. Their job wasn't to make a basketball that bounces harder. Their job was to create, you know, flubber. Um, then it's somebody else's job to bring it to the market. And that's, to me, the most exciting part. Somebody else did the heavy lifting. Somebody else paid attention in science class. And now you get to say, I see a product fit. I see a market fit. Yeah, so shall we take a couple of questions from the audience? Yes, yes I think we let's. should. We have some time. Oh, we got someone right there. Um, now, since you're experts in 3D printing, could you talk a little bit about where we are with 3D printing? Mm. Ah, where we, where we are on the continuum? Is that what you're kind yeah. of referring what to? What kind of new stuff is coming up? Well, Jay, do you have an opinion on that, Jay? Well? Yeah, so right now there are 3D printers doing human organs. There are 3D printing doing um, medication. There's 3D printing doing food. Um, my, my favorite is vegan beef, okay? They now have vegan beef that bleeds. They bred plants with hemoglobin and they can print 3D meat, it's delicious. Um, so there isn't an issue in the printing itself right now. Any, any substrate you wanna do in metal, glass, wood, I mean, people are doing it. The market fit hasn't been brought. So the exact thing we were talking about. People haven't said, here's why this particular product is better 3D printed. And until people focus on that, it'll be a hobbyist, just like PCs were a hobby. I'm old enough that when I bought the first PC, the TV commercial was, you can now balance your checkbook for $2,500. Um, you know, so 
come up with the market killer app the, 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 the killer, killer app. app right and you know from our perspective because we we've, we've been doing this a long time in 3d printing is that really that it's um it's not the delivery system that it's there it's not the pr it's not the printers they're there uh, it's not the materials. There is a lot of work to be done in what I'm going to call post-finishing, so like post-processing of it. So you do 3D print metal, but it still has to be polished. And we have a distributed um, manufacturing system, so we manufacture over in Asia a lot of our products, right? We bring them here to the U.S., and then they're finished over there. They're not finished here. So if we want to print here and distribute here, we now have to build post-finishing into our process. So that needs to come along, but that's not that but far away. Demand needs to happen first. Focus on the killer app. So in, in the AR example, the, my, my stock go-to line of where's the killer app, last year in 2017, Americans bought 80 million pairs of glasses for more than $100 a pair. That only came with one app, Focus. Okay. So for the same price point, you could put on your glasses and they'll translate any sign or menu you see into the language that you read. You'd buy that pair over the other pair. So it's like a smartphone. The first year, they didn't know what those apps would be, and now we all have tons that we can't live without. So focus on, in the printing, what, in my mind, you should steer towards bespoke, customized. What is it that people would rather buy customized? Because um, so, they can demand a higher price. So a great example, prosthetics have been huge in, in, in 3D printing for exactly that reason where a child wouldn't normally get a prosthetic until their teen years because it was so expensive, they can now, for $75, $80, get a functioning prosthetic every year. Because they're growing, and that makes a lot of sense. It needs to happen. And to take it one step further, in the prosthetic example, you know, imagine your, your kid can't play ball and they're left out, and their whole trajectory of their life of being the less than suddenly becomes a challenge. Uh, uh, the young startup went and was doing 3D printed prosthetics and went to Disney for license. And so they do a frozen arm, they do an Iron Man arm, they do a Star Wars arm. So now the kid goes from being less than to being the coolest kid. Ooh, you know, I want Darth Vader on my, on my team. And that opened up a whole market. See, you're smiling, you're seeing a great use of, of, of 3D printing. You know, you'll know a good application in two seconds. I have a process, a 30-day process in Disrupt You to teach you how to solve for that insight. And it's, it's, it works. And you know, give you more deal flow than than a BC. You know, I want to add to that too. There are still well, well there are tremendous advancements in 3D printing in different materials and uh, you know finishes and the capabilities of 3D printers are increasing all the time, and the cost of the machines are coming down, whether they're desktop machines or they're commercial machines. But the one thing that is still eluding the the tech on the delivery system side is being able to make things out of more than one material in one machine. So that still leaves the inherent issues of assembling parts together that are made of a couple different materials that need to go together. Another question over here. <laughs> They're lined up around the block for questions, but you got lucky. Okay. I'll build on the last question. Uh, how long do you think until uh, additive manufacturing gets to the level of fit, finish, tolerance, durability of like injection molding, for example? Is that five I, years away, 10 years away? I think away? it's already there. Well, I think we just don't see it. Like, we see it a lot in that. application, but I just think the general public doesn't see it yet. I agree with that, actually. We, um, while we use desktop 3D printers in our office to make prototypes of things, you can today create, uh, you know, you, the same engineering model that you would send to an injection mold printer and get an actual part back out of certain polymers, now maybe there are some specialized plastics that are being injection molded, may not be available in 3D printing, whether it's ABS or nylon or polycarbonate, you can get so, so close. Like maybe the only exception is a highly polished, clear print of something you would see through like an old CD case used to be or something that you'd have the clear you'd see through. Avionics and the military are doing that today, hmm. in field, reducing the amount of, of parts that they need to have. Um, I'm currently working industrialization and additive manufacturing, and when I speak to my customers, to your point, the skill gap is significant. They want to do it, but there's no labor out there from a designer, from the actual operators. That is a big gap as we see it, is the more 3D printing comes to be, then the more designers and engineers you're going to need to create the actual 3D models that are going to be these products. So wow, it brings us full circle. So the more problems you have, the more opportunity. So instead of advertising, you too can be a chef at Cordon Bleu, uh, 
what a great place to now show that there's uh, a course that you want to teach and a way to certify and set up a program online. Uh, there was a, a professor who was the number one professor in teaching robotics, and he took a summer off, and he said, I'm going to teach a course online, and you get a certificate. It's like he's the Einstein of that subject, and he became a multimillionaire off of just one summer because everybody wants to take the online course, and you have unlimited seating capacity. Uh, so fill the gap. So Huge opportunity. There is a there is a um, HR company, um, human resource and placement company that is working worldwide, Alexander Daniels, and we did an interview with uh, one of their executives, their U.S. operation executives, and they are actively searching around the world to place jobs. And it is they they admit that there is a skilled app, but they're they created that opportunity of being able to spin off what was a generalized company to, f to just filling additive manufacturing jobs. So if there's, a, if there's a placement agency for it, that means that there's a place for all of you to just up your skills, find, find places to go, find, uh, send people. I, I make this talk at... Put the right buzzwords put on your buzzwords. LinkedIn page. Yeah, it, put, put LinkedIn, yeah, exactly. So I do this all the time when I speak to audiences of inventors and designers and things like that. And I'm always saying to them, hey, there's an opportunity here. And lately we've gotten worldwide like we had a, a guy in Denmark right and someone in um, Ireland and a couple of a couple of guys out of Michigan and they were all they said we had listened to you and we upped our skills and we have jobs now we're so busy so it, it can work um, I've been kind of charged as a professor in our department to incorporate 3d printing um, but I teach visual communication graphic design and everything I come across is more manufacturing. And how do we get 3D printing into different people's hands, into more of a creative mm -hmm. field? Are there people creating software that more matches the Adobe products or, or anything that just makes it like, you know, chefs with a 3D printer? How's it more accessible? You know, there are more curriculums being created for, um, for secondary education in particular, I'm thinking of, and in college, uh, that are using 3D printing, additive manufacturing, all, and actually a cross-section of different tools, not just 3D printing, with these students, but it's a end-to-end -end design process they're teaching, and the 3D printing and, and these different technologies are just some of the tools they're using instead of the old shop tools that you know some of us had, I mean, I had anyway, uh, back in the 80s. Uh, so I, I think that through problem solving, whether it's design or engineering, through problem solving, you know, in curriculums that way is a way to integrate these things into, um, you know, what you're doing. And also I think there is um, Adobe actually has a whole set suite of tools and curriculum for shifting graphic designers into being able to 3D print. Um, and ZBrush is probably one of the most common ones where people come out of a more art or 2D design world and going into 3D. Um, it's more applicable to that sort of sculpture and painting route. Um, so they have a whole, and they have huge training sessions and, and fabulous tutorials and groups that help you manage that process. They would be happy to help you. I would add on that tilt brush. So learning to create in 3D and VR. So yeah. the, 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 once you start creating 3D, you're creating polygons and mass. So it'll be very quickly that people will have files that can go back and forth between making physical objects out of that which you've created. You know, there is no absolute standard, though, on the software for how, how you're going to create these models. That you, there, there are hundreds of different tools, everywhere from tablet-based tools that um, mostly younger kids are using for the most part, but actually when they grow, kids today grow up not even understanding how to use a computer mouse. So having a tablet-based software makes a lot of sense. Um, what was it Morphe app, I think, is one of them uh, that is a good tool for that. But there's no, there's no standard, unfortunately. So well, we're wrapping up here. I want to really thank you, Jay, for showing up. Oh, and thanks for having me. Yeah, we really enjoyed talking with you again. Hope all of you. And thank you all for showing up to our talk. We'd like to thank South by Southwest and TuneIn for inviting us and remind you that you can find us at 3dstartpoint.com and anywhere on social media at 3dstartpoint. Please subscribe to the podcast. We'd love to have some new listeners and have new questions. You can always pose questions to us anywhere. Oh, and we got to do the book oh, giveaway. Yeah. So uh, why Jay. don't we just... Uh, Hand it to someone on you your wanna, way out. <laughs> tell you what, well, we can't ravel because no one put it in, but tell you what, you know what I think works often is whoever's got the initiative to run up here and grab that <laughs> book first can have it. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, there you go.
This has been Tracy. And Tom. On the WTFFF 3D Printing Podcast. <laughs>